everybody and welcome to a very exciting very filmic very would we say academic an academic discussion an academic episode of words images and worlds talking with frank baker on this episode uh frank mr baker which would you prefer just call me frank please just frank okay uh Frank, welcome to the podcast, and thank you so much for taking some time to talk with me. I encountered your work years ago, and you probably don't remember this, but I had an article published in AMLE Magazine in like 2016, something like that, and you reached out, you emailed and said, hey, uh, I study these things, and of course, I had already heard of you, so it was uh, sort of a this moment where it was the outside world reaching reaching back to me and saying hey this is a nice conversation to have so uh have followed your work for many years now thank you i love connecting with teachers nothing pleases me more than to read something an educator has written that might be related to media literacy and I'm, i just reach out and say hey do you know about my website or etc yeah yeah and it's such a powerful <laughs> powerful place to look because you know I, I'm an English teacher I've taught English at uh, the high school level taught courses at the university level in middle school and of course we do traditional novels and traditional books and there are things made out of paper everywhere but media has just grown and, and just exploded since I started teaching in 2007 and of course way before then well I've got a brief story uh, years ago, I was invited to keynote to the, the Michigan Council of Teachers of English, and I had this <clears throat> prepared speech at the podium, and two or three hundred teachers gathered in, in this auditorium, the ballroom. <clears throat> and I ad libbed my introduction. I said, uh, "Please, how many of you all have had any media literacy training in in college?" <laughs> I looked left and looked right. Not a one hand. And then I said, "Since you've been in the classroom." How much media literacy professional development have you received? And maybe two or three hands. And I just said, ladies and gentlemen, you can't teach what you haven't been taught. That's my message. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, on the flip side of that, I mean, students consume it. It is there. It's part of daily life. Um, I mean, students have that instantaneous connection to in, any number of media outlets and there seems to be a new one that pops up every week. Um, so I, I guess to start out, we can we could sort of think about and talk about what what is the message for teachers now teaching in 2023? So uh, you can't teach what you've not been taught. Absolutely. Uh, any other ideas that, that come to mind that educators should know? I would, if I was an educator, I would demand professional development that gets me up to speed on the media that young people attend to today. And mostly that's social media. And a lot of schools frown on it and don't want students uh, using it. But we have to think about uh, the, the policies that schools and districts um, uh, pass. I, I'm, I've been an advocate for years of inviting the student to sit at the table when some of these policies are being written. Involve them. Um, years ago, I was at an English teacher's conference here in South Carolina, and a teacher said, Frank, I, I, we can't use our cell phones, except I'm in the hallway at the very end of the last building, and there's no cell service. And I, I knew I would get in trouble, but I decided that I would have an agreement with my teachers, my students. <clears throat> you can use your, your mobile phones, but purely for research and school purposes. And they all agreed. And she said it was a success story because I knew they needed access in order to do what I needed them to do. So I guess I, I, I want teachers to to, to demand uh, training. And, and I hear that a lot. Uh, we don't provide enough professional development for them. So I'm happy to see uh, a number of initiatives pop up in the United States that are providing uh, professional development. Uh, but not everybody can travel and not everybody can afford an air airplane and a hotel room in two or three days, et cetera. So we need to think about 
how professional development can be uh, delivered uh, face-to-face. And I'm a face-to-face professional development guy. A lot of hands-on, interactive kind of work. Um, the pandemic was difficult. Uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult to do a, a Zoom when you want uh, teachers to do hands-on work. But um, mm-hmm. uh, you get the idea. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the pandemic was and continues to be in, in some ways this major just hurdle in terms of thinking about what is it that we do in person that can be done online, that can't be done online, that has to be changed. Uh, I mean, negotiating all of that. And in a way, I mean, thinking about Zoom, the, there's definitely that affordance of media and there are elements of it. And I'm thankful for media that that was able to keep people connected, but uh, definitely lots of challenges at the same time. I was, in, I was involved in distance learning early on when I worked for the public school system in Orlando, and I'll never forget this advice. It said, if you're teaching at a distance, engage the learner early and often. Mm -hmm. And I remembered that advice uh, when I started to do the Zoom, and I would pose questions that I thought teachers would want to respond to. And I thought that's really, you know, very simple kind of advice, because oftentimes, uh, you know, in a Zoom, it's just, you know, and no opportunity uh, for interactivity. And um, Mm -hmm. I mean, I've done enough Zooms where I talk for 45 minutes and they open it up for the last 10 or 15 minutes for questions. And, and, you know, that works for some folks. Yeah, yeah. And and there's nothing like presenting in the world of education that helps you um, grow in being able to talk for 45 minutes. I I taught a class that was all online, all asynchronous. And uh, uh, you were talking before about condensing material to short amounts, which happens a lot in media, but um, seems to be something that you sort of grow into in in the profession in a lot of ways. Um, So also thinking about visual media, uh, because I'm a a big comics fan, big graphic novel fan, um, do do you... Kind of share about that as part of your professional development as well, the the visual along with um, digital media. Sure. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll just tell you a quick story. Um, years ago, I walked into Barnes and Noble and picked up the 9-11 commission report, right? It was, the thing was like this thick. And then I learned there was a graphic adaptation endorsed by the 9-11 commissioners. And I went, Wow. Now, I had worked in Orlando for the public school system for 11 years, and this was in the late 80s. And the librarians tell me, Frank, the the graphic novels, they get checked out and often they don't come back. So I saw early on the popularity of this uh, this medium. And I was I've always been interested in the nonfiction uh, graphic novel. So um, and there are plenty of those out there as well. And uh, it's just, uh, I don't need to tell teachers, the uh, uh, most popular medium, a genre, if you will, uh, in, in schools today. And um, unfortunately, I don't think a lot of teachers yet are comfortable incorporating a graphic novel into instruction. So when uh, we wrote our recent book, I insisted uh, uh, to my publisher that we have a companion teacher guide. I just felt so strongly that it have a teacher guide. And I um, uh, I recruited uh, one of my most respected colleagues in South Carolina, Hannah Baker, no relation, who for years ran the Writing Improvement Network out of the University of South Carolina. And I got to tell you, I think I'm more proud of the teacher guide for <clears throat> We Survived the Holocaust mm-hmm. than I am of the book itself, because <clears throat> that opens the door for more professional development. That was, so my question about visual literacy and graphic novels was actually our segue into getting to talk about We Survived the Holocaust. Um, So anything that you would want to share with teachers that would be considering adding this to their classroom libraries and and checking this out? Interestingly enough, um, a year ago, April, a junior high school student from Virginia wrote a nationally distributed commentary in which she said, and I'm going to paraphrase here, her Holocaust education consisted of one slide listing concentration camps and one handout. And she said, no wonder my generation is so lacking of knowledge. So I started asking social studies teachers uh, in in my world, 
um, why are our students so <clears throat> apparently ignorant? And they said, Frank, we don't have the time. But mm. another co colleague of mine said, Frank, it's not time. They haven't made it a priority. So the short story is <clears throat> the late Mr. Goldberg spoke at our synagogue before he passed away during Yom HaShoah, the Day of Remembrance. And I'm sitting in this audience, and I, uh, I mean, I've heard Holocaust survivors by video and, and testimonies, you know, reading books, but I felt the most powerful message was be being delivered to me. And I'm sitting among hundreds of other people. As he steps off the stage, <clears throat> he walks up to me with this speech, and he says in this beautiful Polish accent, Frankie, Frankie, I want you to do something with this. <sighs> I got to tell you something, those words absolutely changed my life. Now, wow. I, I sat with that speech really feeling um, I'm not qualified. Uh, there's just no way I could do this. But then after years, I approached the family and said, I'd like to create a website uh, that would tell for educators that would tell your father and your mother's story. Uh, both were slave laborers and met and married and immigrated to South Carolina. And so the website is storiesofsurvival.org. And I divided the website into three parts, before the war, <clears throat> during the war, and after the war. And I put a lot of energy into that. And uh, about two and a half years ago, we unveiled it. Uh, the family had given me a box of papers that had survived the war. And I'm going through this box. And here is Mr. Goldberg's Buchenwald ID card. Here is the ship's manifest listing uh, he and his new bride and their newborn infant son about to leave to immigrate to, to the United States. Uh, just doing the research for the website was, you know, very satisfying to me and putting all the assets together that I thought teachers would need. <clears throat> and I've taken that website to Holocaust teachers here in South Carolina and the Social Studies Teachers Conference and elsewhere, and um, you know, to a very positive reception. So that, that, that was great. Uh, but then I, I began to be aware of this lack of knowledge of young people. And I approached mm -hmm. a colleague of mine at the University of South Carolina who had written her own graphic novel. She looked at the website and said, Frank, you are right. This would make a great graphic novel. She put me in touch with, and I'm going to put a shout out here to John Shableski, my editor, and Tim Ogline, my award-winning illustrator. And I had a contract uh, the next day. I had not even written a word. And the result is we survived the Holocaust, and we have a website of the same name, we survived the Holocaust.com. <clears throat> and uh we continue to want to, to reach out to as many young people and adults uh, about about this message. We think is really important at this day and time. And the book actually begins with a little back story um, on anti-Semitism. And I think most of your audience probably knows it has raised its ugly head um, in the United States and elsewhere. So part of my talks when we are invited to talk about this book is to talk about efforts to combat anti-Semitism, which uh, most recently President Biden's envoy to anti-Semitism said, anti-Semitism is a conspiracy theory. Let that one sink in for a minute. Powerful. Mm -hmm. Very powerful. Yeah. Now, so the conversation definitely needs to be had. And, and it's an ongoing issue. It's an ongoing thing. And the, I, I'm still in awe of sort of the climate that we're living in of stories not being told and stories being silenced and dumbfounded that uh, a book like Mouse by Art Spiegelman would be challenged and banned in some places. In fact, um, one of the Goldberg family members said to me, Frank, what would happen if our book got banned? <laughs> I said, that's the best thing that, I, that could ever happen to me, happen uh, to us. Um, you know, Holocaust educators have been telling me this, Jason, we need to get beyond the teaching of Anne Frank. 
Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. one story. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually had a teacher tell me recently, uh, my students are reading um, Elie Wiesel, and your book would be a really good companion to that. So, so what we're trying to do is, and I've heard this from other Holocaust educators, you know, the most effective way to teach the Holocaust is through the personal stories. And uh, that's what we've done with the website and, and with the book. Um, a powerful story of two young Polish Jews who miraculously survived Hitler's final solution. And, and when you read the book, you realize um, it is amazing that they survived. Uh, but there are thousands of, of other stories. Um, recently, I just read a biography of Eichmann, who was the architect of the final solution. And uh, Israel's Mossad kidnapped him from Argentina and brought him to Israel to be put on trial in 1961. And It was the trial was televised live throughout Israel and Holocaust survivors, for the most part, were not anxious to talk about that horrific ordeal. But they came out of the woodwork and said, we want to testify at this trial. And they did. Those who had experience with Eichmann and those who just had stories to tell. And uh, there was a second event that happened that also made, I think, Holocaust survivors more willing to to open up, and that was the <clears throat> the premiere of Schindler's List. Uh, when that film came out, uh, a lot of folks said, "Now I'm ready to tell my story." And and Spiel, uh, Spielberg, <clears throat> the director, gave all of his profits to create the Shoah Foundation, which many of you are, may already know, has interviewed literally thousands of survivors all over the world. So we have this tremendous database now, uh, which is wonderful for students and researchers. When you say that, I just think about the person that shared and said, well, there was this one slide and this little bit of information. And there are the these volumes of firsthand accounts and firsthand experiences. And, and how powerful to meet and interact with someone who survived the Holocaust, but then also how powerful to have someone say, here's my story. I want you to do something with it. I mean, oh, it's, is... it, it, it literally, it literally changed my life. So when I do speak uh, in Columbia, South Carolina, where I live, I always want one of the Goldberg family members to be with me because they tell their parents' story <laughs> much better than I do. Um, and I'm I'm just blown away. One of the Goldberg family members said to me, "Frank, you you just don't know what you've done, documenting documenting our parents." I said, "He's my 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 grandchildren's grandchildren will have this book to read." I mean, it's uh, you know, it's uh, I'm very proud of it, and I appreciate your your uh, uh, bringing it to the attention of your audience. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and I'm also a teacher who has taught night and various books that either deal with the Holocaust through firsthand or secondhand experience. So uh, wonderful book to pair, wonderful book to use as a central text. Um, absolutely. And I will, I will add this. Recently, um, the University of South Carolina received a Library of Congress grant, uh, and, the, and the loose title was Teaching World War II Primary Sources with Graphic Novels. And they invited me and Tim uh, to talk about this. So here, here was an opportunity now for us to talk about the research and what, not only what we found, <clears throat> but <clears throat> excuse me, the importance of, of, of verifying information that, that you get. <clears throat> and I, I, I'm just in my brain, I'm connecting what we've said about media literacy. I'm connecting what we're saying about visual literacy and also just the empathy that's created around getting to know narratives of the Holocaust. And I just have to say that there's so much don't do, don't do. You you hear so much about the negatives of media and, um, you know, the pejoratives that are sometimes put on visuals. But what a powerful way to share the human story. Absolutely. In in fact, uh, right now I'm in the middle of watching uh, the Disney National Geographic series about the woman who hid Anne Frank and and those folks in Amsterdam. <clears throat> and as I'm sitting back watching, I am asking myself how much of this, <clears throat> excuse me, actually happened. But also, 
there's a music bed in the background and and the importance of you know good storytelling and good production and i i really wished our, our partners at, at uh, disney and national geographic had created a teacher guide to go along with this series because it's it's um it reveals the woman who took a chance otto frank said can you help us and she didn't skip a beat she said absolutely and he said you know you, you're taking a huge risk tell me what what i can do and um uh you know, the, the the rest is history. She she discovered the diary, and, and never read it. Uh, she she said it's not for it's, it's not for me to read, and she gave it to Otto Frank. And, and as they say, the rest is history. And I'll I'll just add, the University of South Carolina recently opened an Anne Frank Center, only the third in the world. And so here is an opportunity for us to do more work with teachers as they come through that center and students, and to enlighten them. Uh, to Anne Frank's world, but also the world uh, beyond Anne Frank, and make those connections between uh, anti-Semitism then and now. Uh, because when I do speak, I I'm I'm saying, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there are parallels between 1939 and 2023. In fact, there's an image in our book of Bluma and her family running from their home, which was burned by the Nazis the day they invaded. And when I saw that image last year, I said, oh, my God, this is Ukraine. This is exactly what's happening right now. And, and would students recognize the, the, the parallels, which I think is what uh, teaching should be all about. Uh, this is, you know, this is these are not isolated incidents. And we need to be aware of the rhetoric being used by some people today that is eerily disturbing and I think we have to uh, not be silent. I think uh, somebody said silence is complicity. And so uh, we, we've, we've, we've got to do that. And I'll just share one other. General Eisenhower was there when Buchenwald was liberated. And he said, uh, get the leaders of the other countries and the journalists here to document this because one day somebody is going to say this never happened. And how prescient his words were in 1945. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And when you think about um, how Elie Wiesel starts night with the story of denial, uh, the story of Moisha coming and saying this happened and people not believing him, the, there are these stories, there are these things, these truths that have to be passed down. And that also gets to some of the criticality uh, that's so essential for students right now, for teachers, or for everybody right now, in terms of media, visuals. And I would say that, and I think you would agree with this, a really close and specific reading of media has to involve criticality. We have to be critical. And media can support that, uh, or it can deride it totally in the way that you approach it and and visuals the use of visuals can totally support that criticality as well it's not about simplifying something or uh, folks like to talk about it as, as dumbing down communication methods it's another way of thinking about the way that messages are communicated uh, very very powerful and, and i'm reminded of a book i wrote a few years back um on uh politics in the media. And I began uh, this book by looking at how Lincoln used the media all the way up to, I think it was one of the George Bushes. Um, and most people don't know the name Roger Ailes, who was the late president of Fox News. But before that, he was Nixon's communication manager. Mm -hmm. And Roger Ailes was communication manager of every Republican president. And so I've been fascinated by, and I, I maintain a website on how um, politicians need the media and the media need politicians. And, and specifically, I've done a lot of work around the 30-second campaign commercial and how important it is for young people, the future voters, to understand the techniques of production and the techniques of, of persuasion. Which mm -hmm. reminds me that the techniques of persuasion no longer exist in most states 
ELA standards. And I'm really bothered by that. I know it's been replaced by argument in Common Core, but I think we've done a disservice by taking out techniques of persuasion, propaganda techniques, because they are 360. They're all over the place. And we've got to remember that we need to help students do that. And and these political campaign commercials are using every trick in the book. You know, uh, there's a formula. And when I show th these commercials, uh, we're going to stop. We're going to talk about a particular shot and a particular color and, mm -hmm. and, and music and all of those things. Absolutely. Absolutely. I had some really great lessons on propaganda. And then uh, I've sort of refunneled them and reused them and not completely gotten away from them. But you're absolutely right. Uh, it used to be a directly spoken to area in state standards, and it's not anymore through you know, changes that have come. And so absolutely. Um, I think teachers need to demand uh, when those standards are revised that those kinds of things be reinstated. Absolutely. Uh, speaking, speaking out and speaking up and advocating for students, it's part of the, the process, part of the work. Yeah. I'm reminded yeah. of the librarians today. And, and I was just in March at the South Carolina School Librarians Conference. And I said to many of them, you know, you went to library school in college. And nobody told you you're going to have to testify before the school board about your, your book selection process and procedure. So I think they've, they are at the forefront of, of fighting these, uh, these book bans and challenges. Absolutely. Um, so we're coming down to the last, about the last few minutes of our time together for this episode, but I hope I can have you back on at some point to, to dig in some more to some of these ideas. Um, I always like to give folks the chance to talk about upcoming events, websites. You've mentioned a couple of websites that we'll make sure to to link, but just so that we we leave listeners with a couple of resources that they can go and find once they've sort of stopped the the recording. Anything that you would want to share for folks to follow up with? Sure. Thank you for asking. Um, I wrote a book recently called Close Reading the Media. And I am embarrassed to admit the book did not sell well at all. And I asked my publisher why. And they said, Frank, nobody knows what close reading of the media means. And this is a problem. The close reading of print, uh, most educators are familiar with. Uh, but I created a website uh, to support the book and close reading the media. So it's closereadingthemedia.org. Uh, and, and that uh, followed my personal website, the Media Literacy Clearinghouse, which is simply my name, frankwbaker.com. I actually started that website, the Media Literacy Clearinghouse, uh, I think 25 years ago now, because I wanted to create a, a, a place where I could gather articles and lesson plans and resources um, for educators in, in, in every discipline. So if you're an English teacher, a social studies teacher, science teacher, math teacher, uh, you'll find um, ways to introduce media literacy into instruction, which I think, um, you know, media literacy shouldn't be a separate class, even though it is separate classes in many places. It should be uh, incorporated just the same way visual literacy ought to be in incorporated. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, as I mentioned, those, those are two areas of criticality that students need, people need. Uh, so I appreciate your work in that. And I think um, close reading of the media is, is a very, very valuable topic and a valuable skill to look into. So that may be the the leading point for our next conversation to talk a little bit more about that uh, as well. But thank you also for reaching out to me once upon a time as uh, a young doc student and as a teacher that was just sort of starting to have the courage to put ideas out there and starting to share some pieces of information. Uh, I'll never forget you reaching out to me when I published that article in the AMLE magazine once upon a time. So I appreciate that. appreciate your support of teachers in the profession and glad to talk with you anytime. Well, thank you. You know, um, you have a passion for what you do. And, I, I, and I, I do as well. And my wife said to me recently, uh, with the success of the 
book about the Holocaust. She said, you know, you, you're going to probably be known more for this book about the Holocaust than you are of media literacy. And I said, that's really not a problem. We, we just want to, and I, I kind of end with this, if I may, I'm giving all the royalties uh, for my book to Holocaust education efforts. And I'm going to give a shout out to the family members. Um, during the process of writing this book, they said, Frank, you have put your money into it. What can we do? And I said, how would you like to buy a book for every middle school and high school in South Carolina? And they did. And we distributed those books at the recent school librarians conference. So I'm, I'm very proud uh, of the book. And, um, uh, uh, you know, this is a, a, a difficult time in history, as everybody knows. Uh, but we all have to rise up and do our part. And so um, I, I thank you for inviting me to be part of this conversation, and I look forward to the next time. As do I, as do I, and thank you for your work. And uh, I will be sharing this with teachers as well. So thank you so much. My pleasure.